What's happening everyone, welcome to the Legged Podcast. Before this show starts, I just want to take a minute and tell you all about the secret perks you get if you sign up on Patreon. Now to sign up on Patreon, it is a pound a week, that's it. And by doing so, you get early access to all our guests. You get an extra episode on a Wednesday that is only available just for Patreon members only. On a Saturday, we do a betting show where we've landed some pretty big bets, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, cross footy and boxing and MMA. We do live events, quizzes, you get early access to all them, and anything else we've got going on, it all comes to you first for those who support on Patreon. No better time to sign up. We've got about 100 episodes, maybe, of uh, Patreon episodes, which are hilarious, if I do say so myself. All there available for you now. Get signed up. It's a pound a week, and we'll see you over there. Welcome back to another episode of the Legged Sportcast. Um, we usually we do the it's me Andy Grant, it's me yeah. Jordan Neal, but we switched that up because as you can see, Jay is still in the hot seat, two weeks running. Andy is back in the land of the living, but not sure as and when he'll be back yet because he's still tending to things. But yeah, but um, last week went well. Yeah, good feedback. Yeah. Obviously, it's been another mad week in sports, another mad week for Everton, Liverpool. <laughs> Conor McGregor, boxing, everything we love. But, um, yeah, I think, naturally, mate, the only place to really start again. The Blues. Is the Blues. Um, so, we, we sat here last week saying Dice was the favourite. I think that was, so we recorded Thursday, I think, by Friday. That was pretty much confirmed. We weren't announced until pff, Monday-ish. And then, obviously, he's left with a couple of days left in the transfer window and then the end of the transfer window is probably the most embarrassing thing that's happened in the last 10 days but I mean that's hard to beat some of the things that have happened but that probably was the most embarrassing mm. no communication again I think we spoke on it last week um, the lack of communication and you'd think that did learn but clearly not I mean and um, you know following a few Everton outlets on Twitter and things of um I think the main ones like the bobble and things. Mm. Um I see them say about, you know, how oh, sure is I don't know, but um Bielsa and Deitcher both told Anthony Gordon was leaving um in their interviews and that almost promised two players coming through the door. Um so you know, I think it's probably a blessing that we did get Daichi in the end because I think Bielsa probably would have walked out by now. Yeah, I, I think, think he did it at Marseille, didn't he? Yeah, I think he's done mm. it a couple of times. Well, yeah, something like that. So I'd say, yeah, and we probably would have been in, in an even worse situation. So um, it's a blessing in the end we got Daichi and just, like, if there's a man who can keep an average squad in the Prem, then it's probably him, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's worrying as always, but just got to just pray now, aren't we? To be fair, the players that... I didn't even see a link to anyone really. I know that guy who I didn't know much about, Sultana, went to chose Southampton. Southampton, which is in itself a worry. Like there's one team below us in the league, so effectively one team worse worse than us, and it's Southampton. And your man still yeah. chose to go to them over us. Yeah, I mean we've had discussions sort of off podcast about like why would anyone would choose Everton right now. But I mean, Southampton, it's no it's no better. It's not, it's not like they're looking anywhere. There's, well, as I say, there's one team like, officially in the table worse than us in Southampton. Yeah. And, and then, obviously, a, they're a small, small club, kind of no, no real ambitions, really. And however, yeah. and it being, you know, not mixing with the best over the past few years, but it's, as we said last week, it's still a massive club and still, you know, has ambitions to be back at the top. So you'd think that it entice players over Southampton but clearly he's obviously probably got a brain on the shoulders and things now. Mm. I think it's the pressure as well I mean like you then get a link to players like Andre Ayew who's like mm. I think he's 33 playing in Qatar like that's not I think that's just sheer desperation it, it isn't becomes it? desperation mm. doesn't it and I think you know one of the positive things is as you say Dice is, is this is not unfamiliar territory for him he's done this before mm. he's He's dealt with small squads, small budgets, needing players to overachieve. And I just look at the team and I think, like, I know, you know, two plus two doesn't always make four, but if Dice could get a tune out of a team that was playing the likes of Jack Cork, no disrespect to Jack Cork, by the way, but like Goodmanson, Ashley Barnes, Sam Vokes, Chris Wood, Phil Bardsley, and he was keeping them competitive up until the point where the luck ran out and, you know, Everton could well be in that luck ran out 
sort of conversation. But if you can do that with them, then I look at your team and you look at like Godfrey, um, Cody, Tarkovsky, Onana, mm. Garner, Gray, McNeil, yeah. Gray. No, all of them haven't played great this year. I mean, Onana's been okay, but most of them haven't played great this year. But like for like, they're better than that squad. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's just putting the ball in the goal, isn't it? <laughs> putting the ball in the goal, yeah. And you, you know, you question um, mentalities as well. Although they might, you know, when when you strip it down, you might be better ability wise. But have they got a better mentality, or, or do they offer a fight more than the likes of, you know, your Ashley Barnes? And I know mm. the likes of Tarkovsky. And I are clear to say that they they're in for it and they offer it when it gets tough. But I think going on is the same. He's you know, he's a bit of a Rolls, Rolls Royce player. He's got a bit of everything, you know, and he loves to tackle. Kind of him, you'd, you'd know he'd be on your side. And I think on social media, now he's come out and said, you know, I think he did a, put a post up yesterday saying, um, you know, I've said what I've said and I ain't leaving the ship or something. His caption was, and you know, they're the type of players you want. Look, the chances are he's off in in the summer and yeah. no one can blame him. But look, he, he's going to stick around and grind it out till the end of the season. That's all you can ask for. And I think that's all Everton fans want to see. I yeah. think they just, I think it's the saying like roll, roll up your sleeves and be counted for, you know. And um, the likes of Demari Gray, uh, he's a match winner, Demari Gray. You know what I mean? But mm. it seems like it's probably one in ten games, you know. And we probably need him for the next. We need him to be bang there and you know get that end product going. And look, it, it can change if Calvert Lewin does get his confidence up in front of the goal. If Dyche gets that out of him, then he could keep us up alone. You know and I mean, but we just got to be. I think. Now, hopefully, the fans are behind the players and the manager, and you know, just forget about the fucking board for a minute. Mm-hmm. And just as soon as the kickoff comes, just get behind the players and just try and make it a good atmosphere. Because effectively, I know we did it last year and it shouldn't be down onto the fans, but we can drag them over the line again. Yeah. And I mean, we've proved it year and year. So I think for the sake of the club's safety, just we just got to kind of unite once, once and for all and just go for it again, you know. I think like you got you no know, nice segue, but. You got the first games at Arsenal, 12.30 kick-off at Goodison mm. on Saturday. I mean, obviously, on form, the toughest game in the league. But I almost think it's not a free hit because I know you, know, you need the result at the end of the day. You haven't got any free hits in the last 19 cup finals you've got. But it's sort of starting at a level where you even in defeat on Saturday, I'm mm. not saying you are going to get beat, but even in defeat, you can set a precedent yeah. of, like, we're not going to get smacked. Mm. We're not going to be... Pushovers, we're gonna, we're actually gonna run. We're gonna fight. We're gonna throw our body in front of the ball. I think if if the, if for seventy minutes the players put their life on the line and you know fly into tackles, you know get it heated in there, and then you know seventy minutes our legs go and we get beat two 0 I think Everton fans will walk away with a bit of hope. You know what I mean, if we but do if, that against if, Leeds, we'll win. But, yeah, and if we go, but if we go there, and you know chances are we're gonna get beat. They look a fucking immense team. You know what I mean? Um, but it's how we get beat. I think that's the way I'd look at it. Yeah, you know, if we're prepared to get beat because look, we're fucking bottom of the league and they're top. But um, it's how we get beat. If they if they give everything and get beat, you know what I mean. Everyone will be on the side, but um, the players just need to show a bit of heart and a bit of grit and just mm. just kind of you know the tackles. I think the main thing. One tackle goes in, Goodison lifts. It's mm. always been like that. You know what I mean, and um, we have got matches in there. So you know, like against Arsenal last year, I think it was when we. The Mario Gay scored stoppage time winner. Things like that, you know what I mean? So we have got the players to be able to nick a result or get a draw or whatever, but I think it's more how they go about themselves in yeah. the game, which which will count, you know. I think it's an easy team talk for Dice, me. I think, you know, he probably used the, the lack of signings in his favour and say, you know, almost even our border against us. Yeah. Close the dressing room door and say, There's so, only one way out of this, it's by fighting yeah. now between like, don't go and get sent off. I'm not saying go and stud someone in the shin, mm. but the likes of, you know, brilliant players like Odegaard, Martinelli, Saka, these players, like, don't just let them be great players. No, do you know make what I mean? It go, tough do, thing, like, yeah. if, they, if Saka cuts in, as you say, if Saka cuts in and puts one top in with his left foot, no problem. He's, he's, he's a class yeah, player. Yeah. We haven't got that in our squad at the moment. But don't just allow him to do it. Don't yeah. just, like, stand and look at him and go, oh, yeah, back, mm. uh, Bakayo Saka is a great player. You know, let's just all admire him. Yeah, yeah. At least make it hard because then I think if you come out of Goodison on Saturday and you're like, we've been beat, but like I know as a fan, every player on that team's ran mm. as much as they could. Yeah. 
left if we do that it. against Leeds and the likes of that then we can get a result we can get a result mm. yeah but I think it's a, it's a good place to start I know you, you've got Liverpool and you've got a couple of other tough games but it's not like um, you're not in you're not sort of in a position where you can't turn it round yeah. I think it's just the we want the last 18, 19 clubs that come to oh, it's obviously less the last I think 10 clubs or whatever come to Goodison want them to feel like oh we're going to Goodison it's going to be Horrible yeah, place to go. go. And I mean, no, nah, I think people come with the mentality now, frustrate them in the first 20 minutes, and the fans again in the back. Yeah, and we we'll win. I think that's the truth. Yeah. And it happens. I've been here the past few games. Atmosphere's been shit. I know things aren't going well, but atmosphere's been shit. And the likes of McNeil or whatever, great, give the ball away, or, you know, don't be the first man in the corner, which, yeah, is not good enough, but it happens. And I mean, and yeah. don't just get in the back, like, give them a chance and get behind them. Like, and I think. If we can make good, it's an horrible again. People won't want to come. We will see results come mm-hmm. to me. And hopefully, you know, I was watching a, a golfing with Declan Rice the other day and he, and he was talking about horrible places to go and he was on about Sean Deitch's Burnley and he was mentioning, like, you'd have Tarkovsky pinching the back of your arms and, you know, coming in with elbows to win headers and stuff. And he said, with uh, all of us is half just dread going there. I think that's what we need to make good. It's like it can mm. be like that. It's been like that for years. So I think that's a positive, me. Mm. I think it, people need to stop looking at it as like, I know you know. I don't want you to turn into a. I'm sure you don't want to turn into some, you know, just punting it from the goalie and mm. hoping for the best. But there's there's more than one way to win a football match or to play footy. And I think if you embrace Goodison as being like this place where no one wants to go, mm. and you play a style of footy where. You know, every single opposition player is like, fucking hell, how long ref? Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Not everyone can be Barcelona. No. And you've actually got good players who could fit in that system. The likes of Onana, obviously, you've got Jordan Pickford who can keep you in games. Tarkovsky, Cody's quite like that. Mm. But I just think that you've got a situation at the minute where it's sort of square pegs and round holes. Yeah. You've got players trying to do things that they can't do, that they're not good enough to do. So... You know, in my opinion, it would I would just be solid and then say to Damari Gray and stuff, you know, try and produce a bit of magic or, you know, get the, get the fans on side mm. and then see what happens because as good as Arsenal are and as good as I've, I've enjoyed them this season, you know, they're not, they're not Barcelona. They're not no. like, they're not this like generational team yet. They're mm. having a great season, but they're not a team who you've got like no hope against. Exactly. Like if Everton yeah. got a point or, or one on the weekend, it wouldn't be like, you know, an FA Cup upset. No, but you, you take the likes of... Like look at the size of them. They're not. They're on a massive team. Yes, they got the two centre halves. They're big kids. But mm. you know, Odegaard and Saka and I intimidate them and like man for man. You know what I mean? And look, if if you get rinsed by them and they score, as we say, an unbelievable goal, then you just hold the hands up and say, look, it's just a bit of quality. But just make it make it horrible for them. You know, on Anna like on Odegaard, you know, Godfrey on Saka or Martinelli. Like just just making it like like they did exactly what they did against City. Yeah. First minute, straight through someone. You know what I mean? I'm not saying get sent off, but yeah. make it audible for them, make them know you're there. And like City was exact. If we have the performance like we did against City for the rest of the year, we'll stay up, no yeah. problem. You know I mean, they've I proven that's... this. It's the exact same team. They've mm. proven they can do it. So there's no reason why they can't kind of do it for the rest of the season. Yeah, I think... look, they're not going to perform like that for every game because you know it just doesn't happen. But if you can do it for half the games or three quarters of the games, then we'll have a good chance. Yeah. It? I mean, I don't, you know, I think it's going to be very difficult for you to get out of it now. But I think it's not a, the only reason I think it's difficult is because you don't, I don't know whether you've scored enough goals, but it's not like a no hope situation. Mm. You've shown certain positive signs, but like, you know, away from Everton and a team that's probably not showing any positive signs at the minute is Liverpool. Mm. Get beat again in the, um, in the cool. FA Cup against Brighton, deservedly so. Get absolutely dealt with, you know, Matoma, who looks like a brilliant like, player. Well, I, I said I watched them. I went to the Brighton game where oh, they were left early. Well, and, you know, a Ray Patson and I've not seen many players, but that Matoma gave him a horrendous time. <laughs> yeah, he he was running, sense, right? He was running past, like he stood still. And since I've watched Patson, I've not seen many people do that. He's got a bit of head from Patson. He's pacey, he's strong, he likes to tackle. But he just couldn't live with that Matoma and I think he he tears us to shreds and I remember thinking, Oh I remember thinking oh, I'm putting him in my fancy team. Yeah, I think loads of mm. people have, but I think, you know, before we get on to Liverpool, what Brighton have done, you know, the Tony Bloom there who's you know, is involved in racing and um, David Weir's at the top of their life mm. in a higher in a higher hierarchy. 
you know, the likes of Matoma, Casado, who's obviously pushing for a move to Arsenal, but that's understandable. But, but it's like they, what they got him for, and then what they, what they're basically going to sell him for, whether it's in the summer mm. or it's some turnover. You know what I mean? Trossard, they just done Trossard, the same. Yeah. With, with I know he's been here for a while, but they, they've they've seemed to got something where they've the employing the correct managers, the finding good players, mm. the selling them on for more money, and the continuously improving as a team, like. They didn't beat Liverpool because they got lucky. No. They outplayed Liverpool. Yeah, well, they've done it twice, minutes. haven't they? So? Yeah, so over 180 minutes, they've outplayed Liverpool twice. Mm. And there's not a single Liverpool fan on the planet, myself included, who could look at them games and say, we deserve to win, yeah. because we didn't. And, you know, I know we've got we've got issues, but what Brighton are doing, I think a load of clubs can learn from, because you don't have to go down as this, like... There's this phrase, isn't he, of like a selling club, mm. but it's not. You don't have to be a selling club it's because clever, isn't it? if you if you sell Moses Casado, who's a quality player, but then you've got a chance to then buy four or five mm. players. I know the actual process is selling a player, but for me that's just clever business. Yeah. Because Brighton are now well, establishing the, themselves as not just a Premier League team, but a team that could probably go and get Europe mm. in the next four or five years. But the the year after year, they find these players like. This Matoma costs two and a half million or something. Mm-hmm. You know, ch- there's going to be bids coming in of around sixty million for him in the summer. Easy. So I think every club in the league. Will and like on. he'll go and they'll probably think, oh, they'll say, oh, they won't get another in, but I guarantee you they'll probably have another one lined up and he mm-hmm. he'll come in. I mean, so they're obviously doing something right, and you know, I need to seriously look at kind of that recruitment in that way. But I think everyone does. Me mm-hmm. like, you know, I understand some transfers go wrong or whatever, but. They seem to be consistently getting it correct mm. and moving players on at the correct time. They've got a decent mix of experience where they got the likes of Lalana who comes in and like just I think what they done with Lalana was take him out of Liverpool and go, sort of, what's the mentality like down there? Yeah. Uh, up there. Get that in our changing room along with these young players and now look, you know mm. what I mean? It's it's a it's a very clever way to work. But on the game, like, I mean, Trent Alexander Arnold got had an absolute nightmare. Um against Matoma again got subbed after 50 odd minutes for a 37 or 38 year old James Milner this is obviously someone who was considered the best right back in the world like 12 mm. months ago still a good player I'm not writing him off but there's a theory now that I've read this morning about him he's coming up to a contract ex- contract extension I think he's got a year left or two years left this summer so he would naturally trigger mm. his thing but there's now a debate whether one Liverpool would want to get it, or two whether he would even want to stay at Liverpool in the current circumstances. So, yeah. I mean, no, I don't think anyone this time last year when we're fighting on fronts to win all these different trophies would have predicted that you know we could be in a, we could be heading into a summer where you know Trent Alexander Arnold might even be looking to get a move. But uh, for me, I, I've said it before, I don't think Trent Alexander Arnold is irreplaceable. I said I was on the show maybe 12 months ago even when we were flying saying that you know there's certain things he does that I don't think transfers by being at the top of the game for a long period of time and I think a team's got to be built around him for him to flourish and I don't think Liverpool are in a position to do that yeah, I think the doubt was always I think even when he was good it was kind of put Trent in a bad team would he be the same player and it's uh, it's probably right you know, what I mean? and, you know if he was to leave and go to I don't know Real Madrid or wherever you want to go You'd see highlights of him every single week. Mm. I think, but I, you know, good players obviously perform well in good teams, yeah. and um, I, I'm a fan of him. Even though I'm an Evan fan, I, I'm a fan of him, and I don't think he gets enough help in in front of him defensively. But and I think he is a bit of a scapegoat. Say he is bad defender. Mm. I mean, I mean, he's the worst defender in the world. I just think because he's not doing it going forward as much anymore, it kind of yeah. looks even more, even worse on him, and the pressure comes on him. You know, the only problem I've got is I'm I, I'm quite okay with accepting Trent's a brilliant at going forward, but he's going to get caught out sometimes going back. I'm mm. cool with that. What I don't like this season, especially, is body language, the actual want to defend. Yeah. Like there's a clip of Brighton where he's just looking across I the did, pitch and I did see that, yeah. and then he comes off against Brighton. And it could have been any of them players coming mm. off, like any of them. They've all been terrible. Um, and he's like spitting on the floor and he's looking around as if to say, like, how dare you take me off? Mm. And I'm thinking, that wasn't, that attitude didn't get you to where you are. Why is it developing yeah. now when Liverpool are in a really bad situation? You should be like, not only owning the fact that your form's bad, but like, don't think you're better than getting the taken team, off. Yeah. And I think on the complete flip opposite side to that, you know, you see a 
you see an interview with Andy Robertson, and he basically said, "I'm just feel sorry for the fans because we're just letting them down." Mm. Like we'd be, he's one of the only players who I've heard Henderson as well, who've come out and said, "You know, I've been, I've been terrible, mm. but I'm, you know, we're trying." And I, I think, just think fans can appreciate that though, can't they? But when it's kind of the when you see like the egos come out and that's when fans mm. start getting on your back and. Look, Trent's probably took a lot more shit than Robbo, you know what I mean? So it's mm. probably easier for Robbo, but um, it kind of, it's hand, how you handle the bad days as well as the good days, I suppose, isn't it? I think the biggest, you know, I'm, I'm going to come on to more problems in our team in terms of, you know, Canati's now for three weeks. Fabinho should have been sent off for a horrendous tackle mm. and he's been horrendous all year. Don't know what's happened to him. But I think another part of our problem is social media. Like our fan base, We've got a huge fan base on social media. Mm. So you've got, you know, there's even people like Get Klopp out. You know, there's FSG in, FSG out. There's a group called Spirit of Shank who've done a lot of great work, but then do something where they write to the government and people are saying, oh, that you, you've betrayed the club. You haven't betrayed the club. Mm. Like, there's people on, on like, making <laughs> streaming videos who are, like, 45 years old crying because mm. we're losing to Brighton. Saying, like, the lights over. Like TikTok dancers <laughs> in the crowd, man. That, do, like... I see a bird, I think the other day, not a bird, I don't know if it was a bird or a man or whatever, but um, she was complaining because someone was stood up in the aisle or something yeah. and thinks she was in the cop or something or he was in the cop. But I think we've and got I was just like, what's, what's going on, like? When we're winning and we're doing, you know, Champions League, leagues, FA Cups, everyone's arms around each other and it's Liverpool, mm. do you know what I mean? And then, but like when you're in a bad situation, all this stuff comes to the fore and I don't read, like there's only one outlet where I'll read news really. Um, I look at BBC News here and there, but I read news mainly on the Athletic, mm. which is like behind the paywall, and I, I I like the people who write there. But like, if I was one of them fans, the a Liverpool fan especially, who was getting my information about my club or about football from Twitter, I would hate Liverpool. Mm. I'll be like, fuck them, because they're just a gang of weirdos. You know what I mean? And I feel for, you know, we've got a cousin who who travels home and away, no matter what game, what cup competition, or what teams fielded out. And there's plenty of Liverpool fans who, you know, spend a lot of their hard-earned money going to all these games. And I feel for them, because they're getting, like, you know, tarred with this brush of, like, you know, glory hunters. Well, and not that. about and the Everton ones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> Everton fans, to be fair, they're, they're better. But I do feel for... Because, you know, I wouldn't consider myself, like, a die-hard fan, because I don't spend... I got, I've got a ticket for the home games, but mm. I don't... And I go to most of them, but I don't go to the away games, mm. you know what I mean? And... I feel for them fans because they... It's a whole weekend, basically. Most then, of them are, like, mm. still... You know, I've seen things about... A lot of young lads were in the away end at Brighton and they created a new song for Diego, Diogo Jota. Mm. And they were like, we lost, but the, the away end's boss. And I was like, well, you're a real fan. Yeah. And then on the flip side of it, you've got, like, 40-year-old fellas on Twitch going, mm. the club's finished. Sure, yeah, and, and it's getting more, more... It's probably getting more of a user yeah, around the world. And I'm thinking, like, we've won. Klopp's been here for like seven, eight years. Mm. For five of them years, we've dominated either in Europe domestically or in a cup competition. Mm. One bad season, and you're like, you're crying on Twitch yeah. or TikTok. And it, I think, I guess it's just mentality of, I think it's just mentality now of, of, of football fans and, you know, online content and the all way that. Life's but gone, it, yeah. does, um, it does, it does bug me. But, you know, on the pitch again, Fabinho, that tackle is about. I think the only people in the whole who, who watched or seen, the only people who didn't think it was red it was clearly the refs and yeah. the officials I think even Fabino, you could tell by his face was like money. yeah I think but he was gutted as if to be like how have I got to form when you see his face and like I'm he, doing yeah. stuff like this like I mean we've had a lot of players fall off um, but Fabinho's form is for me like I consider them genuinely I've, I've, I even look back the other night about tweets I put out I consider them our best midfielder one of the best in the world and I was so in the camp that when he played Liverpool were better, mm. he now does nothing but hinder the team. <clears throat> and I don't understand. I really don't understand it. Like he's now becoming like, oh please no. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like we put Milner in there. Mm. And is it a form issue or is it something else? I don't know. But you know, I'm I, I am really concerned about him. But you know, we now lose Canati for three weeks. Van Dijk's out. Matip can't stay fit for longer than you know half a minute. We, we're back to Reese Williams and. I see that was that was Nat Phillips. Isn't yeah, Nat Phillips. He's trying to kind of force a move away, which I don't mm. think anyone could really blame him. And then when it looks like he's probably got the chance to go, I think obviously Kanati's going to need to go <laughs> stay again, which is. I mean, Nat Phillips is a good player. He well, played... I've seen, I've I've not I've not watched to be honest, I've not watched a lot of them, but from what I've seen, my mates tweeting on Twitter and that, 
every time he's played, he's you know been very good. And but he's not flashy, but like you know, he's done the funny things where he, he crushed Zlatan I've seen, San uh, Siro and all that. Now. But he's got this tag of being like a jovial, funny player who's like lucky to be at Liverpool. Mm. He's never let us down once. Mm, yeah. He scored goal. He played good in big games. He's come on with the Al Terry Butcher looking bandage around the head. Mm. When we had an injury crisis the other year and snuck into the top four, he was integral to it. All he wants to do is play games. Like I think you're looking at him thinking, you know, we just spoke about Everton for 10, 15 minutes. If you had a player like him, maybe like, you know, with his attitude now, mm. you'd be fucking made up. And I just think it's 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 one of them where, you know, I, I'm not against them being back in the team, but for him, he probably does need to get away and, mm. um, you know, start Play building a career for himself. But, Picking up some other news, obviously United versus Newcastle in the Carabao Cup final, even though some people disrespect the, the, the actual cup, it's still, you know, it's going to be huge for, obviously, Man United with Ten Hag getting his first well, trophy. And I think they're, all, they're the only team to be left in all domestic competitions mm-hmm. and things exactly. like that. It's just, you know, they could effectively do, they could effectively have a well, double, maybe a treble, you know, so. And obviously Newcastle, don't think Newcastle have won a trophy since, like, 1955. I think it's six, 69 years or something, isn't it? Yeah, I'm going to get it up now, exactly. I think it is 60, 69 years, I think I read. Um, 1955, yeah, yeah, so, I mean, that's crazy. And if they can get the Carabao Cup, I just think, you know, I don't I don't sort of assign to this group of, you know, Newcastle are going to go on and dominate world football. Mm. I'm not in that camp, but if they can get a trophy this early, why they're still building a team, yeah, why they're bringing, massive, yeah. bringing the likes of Gordon in, signing Trippier into a longer-term contract, got some good players in there. Get one trophy over the line, mate. The sky's the limit. Mm, and, and I think, well, I think it'd be a good final. I don't think there's two better teams in the Premier League that are in form at the minute. Mm. I mean, regardless of Arsenal, but I think United and Newcastle don't really fear anyone at the minute. And I think um, <coughs> when they clash, I think it'd be. I think everyone would be watching. I think it'd be a good game. You know, I, I can see United beating them, but um, I think it's going to be a, a really good game. I know. To be honest, I I'll be sitting hoping that Newcastle win, but as you say, I think it's a um, it's a very tough it's a tough like game for them. But I mean, if they can get over the line, I just think it's an amazing achievement, and their fans are going mental mm-hmm. because they've probably got a generation of fans like Everton. We've yeah, never, yeah. never well, seen it. So, a couple of generations, you know, even right? worse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, <coughs> a, a couple of other things that happened. One that come completely out of the blue. We had um, Cancelo moving to Bayern. Yeah. Um, Reports of like a fall on out or something mm-hmm. was he? With Pep, or he, he kicked off. Well, not playing, and Pep said, "All right, see you later." And I think yeah. that ruthless streak is what makes a good manager, in my yeah. opinion. Um, but then, like he, his first game, he puts in a world of cross, gets a chip on moting, get, gets an assist for the whole chip on moting. And I think what a career he's had! Oh, mate, unbelievable. unbelievable, unbelievable. Couldn't get a game for Stoke, and then he's gone PSG and PSG Bayern. Bayern. He's in alone somewhere else. <laughs> unbelievable. What a guy! <laughs> he got another goal in there, and I just think, yeah, it's. Cancelo for me, I think I couldn't believe more, more Prem clubs went after him. One in particular, Chelsea. Were going to I don't know whether it might have happened too, too quick. quick for anyone yeah. to even catch a wind of it. I, I like Cancelo. I think that's a great move for him. I think he'd be brilliant there. And I just, you know, it just throws up the thing about City and Pep, where you know they they need to get that Champions League monkey off their back mm. a little bit. And I personally, I just think going into a long season cup competitions two legs in the Champions League with Nathan Ake at left back mm. not saying he's a bad player but I think in them big games I would have preferred having someone like Cancelo who can also help in the other half you know what I mean definitely yeah but I suppose you can look at it two ways if he's gonna if there's you know a bit of um, animosity in there it could affect the mood in the change room you know so you can kind of look at it two ways whether it's just a ruthless streak in Pep which you need to be that at the very elite level or whether it is a genuine mistake and you know I see someone um, an interview questioning him the other day with does he regret letting Zinchenko and yeah. um Jesus. Jesus go and he said no, he says it's just football. So he's a clever man, like mm. I know he get, you know, he's got critics, I've criticised him from time to time, but you know, he can't he can't really argue with his you know, he, he moves on quick mm. and he doesn't you know, one criticism we come on to a couple of Patreon questions in a minute, but one criticism of Liverpool is that we've stood still. Pep yeah. doesn't stand still. No. He just keeps moving and I think that's what separates the good from the great in, in in my opinion. And I'm not saying he's a much better manager or a better manager than Jürgen Klopp or, you know, better than anyone, but I just think whether it's a club or it's Pep, I just think that ruthless streak is, is something that you need to yeah. have. But one team who have got a ruthless streak but just with the dough is Chelsea. 
<laughs> I mean, I don't. I'm not going to sit here and profess I know everything about financial fair play. No, I don't. I'd love people to educate <laughs> us on because how do how can you spend this too much though and not have no repercussion? As he sort of like they have to qualify for the Champions League or or something like that. Otherwise, the players can't be registered. Some mad nice. man said that, but they're in temp for something. <laughs> And like chances are, they, you know, I mean, unless Graham Potter's a... absolutely like he's under serious pressure now. I think they spent like well, it's easily over over a billion. He's going from Danny Welbeck to yeah, like I don't. I, he probably doesn't even know half the players that are coming into training. But you know, when they sign all these players, obviously Ted Bolly, who's in charge, has just got an open, just got himself an open. Um, got a bit of mic issues here. <laughs> got himself an open checkbook sort of thing, and then. The go and sign Enzo Fernandez for a hundred and five million. Who's off the back of a World Cup? Go World Cup. Decent player, like, but well, have any of us mil? seen? Have any of us seen enough of him? No, but I mean, I think Benfica signed him for ten in the summer and they sold him. So they've sold him for one hundred and five, and our boy Darwin Nunes for like sixty odd. Yeah, heavy guy. <laughs> so you know, Benfica like Brighton are doing something right, but I think he is a good player. Well, See about two weeks ago, he was kissing the badge to bed. can say yeah. I'm staying here, and so yeah. But mate, imagine he's getting a you know, ten percent or at least a couple of percent of hundred and five mil. It's hard to say no to. But I think the thing with the Chelsea thing and the reason we can't really stay on it too long is I don't believe you're going to know how this plays out until he tries to fit them all into a team mm. because yeah, he's signing quality. He's got quality. He's let a bit of quality go in terms of Jorginho, um, but then he's brought in. Um, they tried to get rid of Ziyech as well, but they sent the wrong paperwork to PSG, mm. which, again, is crazy. But to get so many players, so much money, so much pressure, you've got to get Europe or people can't get you know, signed on, like, can't be included in the squad. Graham Potter has now got not only a, a squad to try and assemble in the middle of a season, but also he's got to win games from Saturday. Literally, or yeah, from, to, yeah. There's no... Because everyone who's played, you've got no excuses, or... I think it is probably harder to get a team's gel middle of the season to bang straight away, you know what I mean? But people are going to expect them straight up to into Europe now, I think. And, um, you know, the way football's going, if he went, if Graham Potter went in charge to start the season next season, I wouldn't even be surprised. No, I wouldn't mm. at all. But you forget they've got, like, a Bamiyank. He barely plays, just floating around the squad. and just then picking up dough in, me. That's what I mean. Like and then they've been in America or China or something next The year. overheads are just absolutely crazy but again you're not really going to know you know until time until sort of things play out but as people know by now if you if you're on patreon you've got an opportunity to get involved with the um with the sportscast you can you can ask questions and we'll do our best to answer them but just while we're on football we had two football questions this week um one from liam doyle and one from jamie carey so Liam Doyle's one was quite interesting. He said, "Sorry, lads, are a football-related re- one. Do you think the Premier League has become like Serie A was a few years ago? Score a goal and defend and try and win one nil. Too many passes sideways and backwards. If FIFA introduced a new rule that you didn't allow your t- you, that didn't allow you to be able to pass the ball back into your own half, I think that would be good. I think it also shows with non-league football attendances. Take Marine, for example. They used to have an average attendance of three hundred. Now it's around one thousand two hundred. Now." I don't agree. To be honest, I don't agree with your rule of not passing back into the to the into your own half because I think you know sometimes not to try and come across like a coach, but to go out to come back in mm. is a thing. But I think I do one hundred percent think that a lot of people are losing faith with the Premier League yeah. and being priced out of being able to be a Premier League fan because I know right now, like you know, if I could, well, I couldn't get two tickets next to each other. I already pay a big amount to go to every game but if my lad want, or my daughter wants to start going it's a very very expensive trip mm. like to Liverpool it's a very expensive trip if you can even get tickets and you know I think that people are now cottoning on to the fact that you know non-league footy is not just pub players running into each other yeah. some decent quality down there Marine have got a nice ground Prescott Cable's got a decent little setup going on I think people are just realising there's an alternative aren't they I went to a um... One of my mates plays for a witness, and I went down there to watch them against Bootle the other week. And uh, f- there's a belter crowd there, mm. and uh, I think it was on a Saturday. It's boss crowd. It's a good game, like old fashioned kind of footy, and um, I was kind of surprised by it, but like, it was mm. I uh, properly enjoyed it. And um, 
I think there's a, there's a lot of kind of lower teams now that are attracting crowds just to kind of get fo- get the football feel yeah. back. You know what I mean, I recently went down to Fresco Cables on a um, it was a Friday night or something. I was only on my own, and I um, sort of stood there and I enjoyed it myself. Mm. And I, I thought like, you know, there's there's actually some kids there as well. Like obviously, you know, it's surprising where kids will be like, I want to go and see Salah. Yeah, yeah. and but now, like, I think it's more family friendly, and I think, you know, I know there's some there's certain idiots who go, there's certain idiots everywhere, but it's like there's, there is a viable alternative to enjoy football now mm. for a much less cost, and we're living in a time when we are in a cost crisis, and I just think, you know, if, if non league football can become um, a beneficiary of that, then I'm all for it. But Jamie Carey goes on to say, just to finish off our roundup of football before we move on to boxing and MMA and stuff, how catastrophic do you think that? The fact Liverpool have had such a poor window, we'll see the rest of the season playing out. Much the same, it's much the same, if not worse, in my opinion. And do you think Bajetic, is if that's how you say his name, is up to the job if he's left in for the duration? I think he should be left in to develop, nothing, nothing to lose due to the state of we're already in. I think he'll be good enough, and I'm quite what you say. I would leave him in because I don't think anyone is playing better than him in that position. No, I, I've watched him a handful of times and. I think he's a top top player. Mm. He's got everything to be good. He's got everything. Like he, he looks like he still looks like a kid, doesn't he? Mm. It's because he is effectively, but he still looks like a kid. I think he's probably still growing, strengthening up, and you know, there's going to be times this season he's probably going to make mistakes. But I think it's it's a bit like Evan fans you got to just back him rather than getting his back. You know what I mean? And, yeah. Um, I think in years to come he's going to be a, a top class player. You know. Yeah, I think he hundred percent will be, and I think yeah, leave him in. I think Liverpool we've we've touched on it. I've had. You know, a bad window, but I personally didn't expect anything else. I don't think I like to think I've got a good read on how the owners and that thing and that um, sort of act and the manager really. And I just didn't ever see us mm. going in. I know we got Cody Gakpo, but I think, I think Klopp as well. He likes a certain type of player, doesn't he? And mm. I think he probably does have a big say when he comes in, and mm. um, he's not one to <clears throat> he's not one to kind of panic buy, is he? Like other clubs and. Um, Look, I think you should be sound, and I think you should probably end up in around the Europe and Europa spots when it comes down to it. But um, I think you should be all right. As I say, you got some world class players still, and it only takes them to get a bit of form for you to get back firing, you know. So I think um, I think come the end of the season, you'd be all right. Yeah, I, I do as well. And I think, you know, I said to Andy the other week when we done a show, I think, you know, things are, things are going to be a little bit different, I think. I don't think we're going to dominate the league for the next couple of years, but I also don't think we're going to come last. No. you just got to understand process and, and, and cycles. But moving on, anyway, we've had a bit of an eventful week in the world of boxing. Um, I think naturally the best place to start is, I was going to start with Tommy Fury versus Jake Paul, but I think naturally the place to start is Anthony Yard um, against Better Beer, which mm. was about the most entertaining eight rounds you, you're probably ever going to see. Obviously, Better Beev wins by stoppage um, in the eighth round or the corner coming, which was a great decision from Tunde, someone who I've given a lot of stick to in the past. But, you know, I think Better Beev proved that he's still world-class. There's, there's holes in the game, but he's still world-class. But I think Yard proved that he can mix it up there as well. Mm, yeah, I was, a, I was out having a pint with mate and watched it and... Um... Luckily for me, I said oh, I do fancy a bet, and he said the eighth round better be ever. So <laughs> I had to turn it on it. Well, I had um, I didn't do a betting show because there wasn't as much on the undercard as I expected. So I did um, I write an article for Star Sports bookmakers, and I mm. put better be ever seven to twelve. And I sort of seen, I sort of predicted how it would play out because I always thought Yard would be sharp early, and mm. better be ever's got so much experience that he, he's not gonna. I know a lot of his fights are finished in four rounds, but that's a lot of the time when people hit him and he just swings back and goes, good night. But I think he was always expecting Yard to improve, be younger, be faster, be fitter, be sharper, and then eventually get to him, which he did. But, you know, I think I had a bit of a back and forth this week on Twitter with um, another lad called Jamie, who, who I respect and I like, um, because naturally from the back of this victory, they're saying, make the Bivol fight. But better be a vs Bivol is never going to happen. No. promotionally, cross promotionally, it's just not going to work. You know everything that's going on in Russia, it's not going to work. And I mean, yes, if they, yes, if they get rid of the WBC where Callum comes in, um, which is where, where we had a little bit of a disagreement. But if you get rid of the WBC, then yes, they can make the fight. But they, them two are not going to fight with, without all the belts on the line because mm. what I think what a lot of people don't understand. I've seen people going, we'll just get rid of the belts, but 
that's for us as fans. Yeah, get rid of the yeah, belt and just go at it. Like, no, I'm yeah. not going to get rid of my belt that I've worked my whole life for, that no. I've dreamed for. I think I had a great chat with Jazza Dickens this week, which is coming out um, on Saturday as a little bit of a bonus episode. We spoke about everything from life to, you know, boxing. And when you sit with someone who's a boxer, you understand their mentality so different to ours. Mm. None of them are going to sit there and just relinquish a, be- a belt because they want the fight to go on. To make everyone happy, yeah. And mm. everyone's sitting Unless there. it's obviously for silly money, but I think the, the, yeah. the lads are putting life online. They want to secure the families and... Mm. and Effectively, they're all win- has that winning mentality, don't they? So they want to kind of the belts to kind of be there. And I think uh, going back to the yard fight, I think he got himself a lot of fans on the night, yeah, didn't he? 100%. If you weren't a fan of him, you kind of seen that he probably is world class, and um, you know he does have a big heart and fair play to him. And you know, in the end, it was just one too many yeah, I mean, punishing it. I it? think we, I think Anthony Yard's a good fighter, but I think, you know, ultimately, at two times at world level, he's come up short, but not for the want of trying. Mm. He's just come up short because I don't think he's good enough at that level, and there's nothing up with that, but I think next time Anthony Yard fights, he'll be, you know, I'd love to see him fight Boatsy. Yeah. I'd love that big domestic fight. You know, there's a fight with Callum Smith that'll be brilliant. I think there's a lot of options for him, and I'm just glad, you know, you'll see on the chat he had with Jazza where we were talking about certain journalists who were like, you're losing, you're done. Yeah. Like, uh, he's not done. He's just getting started. I think he, you know I mean? he probably, um, from what I could grasp anyway, um, it probably was like a win for him anyway because I, don't, I didn't hear many people say a bad word about him. You know what no. I mean? And um, although he kind of went out and got knocked out but, or got stopped, he, um, he earned a lot of people's respect hmm. for being a scrap and I think a lot of a lot of people are going to want to make fights with him just because he's exciting to watch because, it weren't just one sided, like <laughs> it weren't just one sided. Um, <laughs> Never heard an orgasm with a sea. It weren't uh, really one sided. He he rocked your man, didn't he? And yeah. um, he threw a good digs of his own, and um, you know showed he can mix at that level. So I think, um, although he lost the fight, I think he's still mm. kind of won moving forward. One the thing, one thing that Anthony Yards now got is a fan base, and I think you know again um, a couple of the arguments that I was having on Twitter was like. We're hardcore fans, so we should be pushing for better BF Bivol. And I get that. I'm here for it. I mm. want to see it. But ultimately, the only place that happens right now is in is if there's money available where them two fighters go, there's too much money, I'm, I need to be mm. involved. The only place that money comes from is Saudi. Saudi are not interested in better BF versus Bivol. No. Doesn't do, it's a hardcore fight. Neither of them have got a following. Mm. Neither of them are very charismatic. They're just both incredibly talented. <clears throat> Saudi would rather take J- what we're going to come on to in a minute, Jake Paul versus Tommy Fury. Because of the, the old Raw and the press conferences. Then better be, off, yeah. better be a bivol. That, and that's a fact, and that's where boxing is entertainment at. business, mm-hmm. I suppose. And, then... and, I, and again, this is where, you know, going on to the fact that I thought better be have showed signs that he can be beaten. And I don't subscribe to this thing that the only person that can beat him is bivol at this stage. And that's when, so I said, I need to see Callum Smith in the fight. I need mm. to see Callum Smith better be have. And that's not because I'm like, oh, bivol. Bivol and Better Behave shouldn't fight. They should do Callum Smith because, you know, he's scouts and I want yeah, to do the old yeah. Tony Bellew. What people give Tony Bellew stick for, get the scouting in. Just logically in my mind, that fight's not going to happen because I know the sport. Mm. Better Behave Bivol doesn't happen. What's the alternative? Who better in the world than Callum Smith to fight Better Behave? Mm. There's not. And he's oh, the, despite the fact that he's, he's, already, he's also placed at the WBC to be in the number one position, they're not going to let that belt go on without Callum Smith fighting for it. And then people go, well, he's not world class. Okay, no problem. Like, I'm not even going to get into that debate because, you know, they say, you know, John Ryder beat him. Very close fight and I love John Ryder. Good fight. But then, he beat Groves. Suddenly, Groves had one arm. Mm. Like, you know what I mean? Like, th- this is the Groves that beat Chris Eubank Jr. Yeah. who everyone was saying, you know, was going to destroy Liam Smith. So, like, they, they pick and choose. And I understand there's an agenda where they're like, you know, scouts is all stick together. You only want Callum to get in. And he throws against Canelo. Callum got beat by Canelo. Mm. So, like, I, you know my thoughts on Canelo. The fella's a drug cheat, but it doesn't take the fact he's one of the best fighters in the world. Yeah. Um, just because I don't support him. So, and I think, I genuinely think, if you had, if you've sat and gone excited about better be a vs. Yard, with Yard's only ever had one fight up at world, world level and got stopped. Mm. And then you've got a problem with Callum Smith, who has fought Canelo, fought John Ryder, who's a good fighter, beat, Cal- beat George Groves, 
was WBC and isn't think, John Ryder fighting? Yeah, he's going to fight Canelo. Canelo so yeah. this thing where like everyone's like, well, John Ryder be we took Callum Smith close or beat Callum Smith. John Ryder's a good fighter. Why? Where's the disrespect? For, why? Mm. You, so because he took Callum close, that that makes Callum a bad fighter. Yeah. So in turn, you're saying John Ryder's a bad fighter. You're Although not making he's any sense. Fighting Canelo. Yeah, now. and then like and then you know you go on, you go okay. So wh- if Yard was a respectable opponent that you can get excited about. Why can't the former unified super middleweight champion, who is, yes, not fighting the greatest competition up at 175, yeah, but knock two people out clean. Mm. Better be of showing that he can be caught with certain shots that Callum throws perfectly well. So what all I'm saying is Callum Smith versus Better be of is not a better fight than Better be of Bivol, but it's a more realistic fight that's going to happen. And I genuinely believe if he that... Can't, if he can't go through Callum, then he's going to have no chance with Bivol, is he? So That's what I mean. Can, it's, a good, it's an even better stepping stone up if he wants that Bivol fight. He's which... better be a, a favourite in the fight at 19-0 and 0 with 19 KOs and a really, really respectable amateur career. Yes. Hmm. Is Callum a credible opponent that could win? Yes. Hmm. Like, you're a boxing fan and I understand all this about we want the best fights, but... If you're a boxing fan or you're reporting on boxing, know your sport. Yeah. Know the fact that politics are in the way. You shouting about it going, make better be of Bivol does not get us any closer to being at me. It's not it's not happening. Mm. But anyway, yeah, I think that was a bit of a ramp. But I think you'll see the Callum Smith fight next. I know he's fighting the eleventh of March in Liverpool. I think he's fighting an undefeated guy who you know, in all fairness, won't give Callum much problems. But I think then at the back end of the summer you'll see um Callum fight better be of in my opinion. But Going from world class fighters and someone who's moved into world class and anti yard to two novices who are going to be fight on pay per view, Tommy Fury announces versus Jake Paul mm. at the top off in the ring. He's got a mad body, to, uh, Tommy Fury. You know, He's chiseled like any. You no, know, but his shoulders are forward. Mm. Like, like he looks like that kid. Have you ever seen where there's a there's a lad on like Instagram reels where he's like, you're not ugly, you've just got bad posture. Mm. So you put your neck forward and put that. That's what he's like. But you know, as a fight going on, the point again. Saudi Arabia have picked it up. It's on 26th of Feb, I believe, um, pay-per-view on a Sunday night. Two novice boxers. You know, I make Jake Paul a favourite just because of what we've seen. Like, it's a crazy, crazy concept, but what do you make of it? I'm half I'm looking forward to it, you know. <laughs> man, I, people, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to People watch. might frown upon that, but I'm half looking forward to it. I think it'd be funny. <laughs> and I'm, I'll be team Paul, man. I go to the city of sex. Imagine how Ballas and Abby get knocked out by a YouTuber near the Benz Fiori. Like. Fiori said, if he, uh, if he loses, he can stay in style. He beats uh, Ronaldo's P- PT. <laughs> but, it's true, though, isn't it? I mean, a lot of shit's been spoken. I, will it happen? Sides. Will the fight happen? Because, isn't it? Your man's pulled out twice, isn't he? Yeah. And he's just had a baby. So, if it happens, then fair play. Well, but... they, you know, there's a bigger problem the fact that there was more cameras on him and uh, Jake Paul and Tommy Fury squared off in the ring before Better Be of Yard than he was um, on actual Better Be of Yard, but it shows you what people want to see, and you know it's going to do crazy numbers. And I don't know whether, I don't know whether Tommy Fury's going to handle it. I think uh, see, Jake... I, I watched an interview on um, Eddie Ayn saying uh, he thinks Jake Paul will beat um, Tommy mentally before he's even in the ring, and then he thinks by the time he gets in the ring he'll be mm. shallow of himself, which. That's Tommy Fury is, I know he's on Love Island now, but he is horrendous in front of a camera. Yeah, he is. He, he trips himself up. He, he literally just ties himself up and doesn't, and he just talks shit. It's hard. But he's, he's just like, he just comes across so thick. Yeah. It's hard when your brother's a charismatic heavyweight champion. Mm, and he tries kind of to do that, but yeah. he's just like... <laughs> and your dad's, a, your dad's a bit of an idiot. Dad's a hell, mate. Yeah. And I, I think for everything that I, I criticise Jake Paul, like I don't, you know, to be fair to him, I asked him to fight a boxer on the show and he's fighting a boxer, so, you know, box tick. But I don't think he's great. I don't think he's ever going to do anything in boxing. But I don't think Tommy Fury is either. So I think it's, to me, this is two fighters who are at a similar level. Tommy Fury didn't have any, like, an exceptional amateur background or nothing. It's not mm. like, there's not some Team GB athletes. But, like, I think... I don't know who changed Tommy Fury. I think his dad. I don't know how much he's dedicated into, you know developing his craft one thing you can't take away from Jake Paul is he's put himself around you know like fighters there's a couple of people in there BJ Flores and that who are donuts but there's people he's investing in every side of the sport from nutrition to trainers to sparring to gyms he'd have a big old team behind him wouldn't he yeah and mm. I think when you progress progressing at novice level I just think he might have come a bit further than Tommy Fiori look 
I want Tommy Fury to win for the good of boxing. If Tommy Fury knocked out Jake Paul, I would sit on our couch on the Sunday morning and go, nice. Mm. But also, can I see a world where Tommy Fury beats... Uh, Jake Paul beats Tommy Fury? Yeah. Mm. Like, it's not... I think it's going to be an horrendous fight. I genuinely do. I think there'll be a lot of shit talk. Then they'll be talking about knockouts, and I think they'll Mm. essentially gas and hug each other. Coach, aren't they? (laughs) But if if Jake Paul does, for whatever reason, KO Tommy Fury, where does he go from there? Tommy? No. Jake? Jake. Well, he's got to then continue to fight boxers, hasn't he? Mm. And that's where it all unravels, because the minute he fights, for example, I think he's fighting up at Cruiserweight or Light Heavyweight, Mm. somewhere around there. If he, I know he's talked about Canelo and stuff, but let's take, let's look at the light heavyweight British champion, which is Dan Aziz, or people flirting in and around there who are Joshua Boati, Anthony Yard, mm. Calum Smith, I don't know the British level bit further on. If he fights any of them at light heavyweight, he gets calm at all. Yeah. Uh, light also up a cruise weight to look at if he was to fight Richard Riachpo. CBS, isn't it? CBS, mm. calm at all. Lodden to Coley. Yeah, but they're them. world level, aren't they? Yeah, but but that's what I'm saying. He's not going to fight Jake Paul, um, Tommy Fury, and then go and fight the British champion. Mm. He's going to go and fight. He, he will eventually, I reckon, I'm, end up with a ranking in, in some sort of governing body because they'll mm. have their hands all over this fight and they'll want a belt on there and all that stuff. But I think, in my opinion, Jake Paul's limit is about British title level where mm. he'd get beat and he'd get beat handily. But he's never going to choose that. So And he also he can't sell someone who's like, I don't know, a French cruiserweight, 15 and 0, who's number 14 in the WBC rankings. Mm. From this point on, he needs names. So, the na- unless he goes back to the old MMA stuff. But, you know, good luck to them. I think, it's, I don't think it's going to be a great fight, but I'm intrigued by it. So, you know, I don't, I wish it didn't have the column inches and the, the, the highlights it does over real boxing, but he's fighting a real boxer, so I guess we've got to get in line and, and appreciate it. But, yeah, obviously Saudi Arabia have picked it up and, Good luck to them, but I don't know if we spoke about last week about the elbow with Liam Smith and Chris Eubank. I don't think so, no. I, mean, I think we might have touched. I think we passed it because we thought well, a lot of bullshit. But yeah, I think Callis Ireland coming out and you know claiming elbows is a little bit ridiculous in my opinion. Um, Liam Smith's handled it really well. I think we'll inevitably see the rematch, but you know, I, I don't, I don't believe just for the record, I don't believe any of this is from Eubank. I don't think he's no. going. I don't think he's sitting there going, tell him he elbowed me. Get in the mm. papers. He's probably, you know, licking his wounds a little bit and thinks he can beat Liam. So the rematch is, is what we all want to see. Another rematch that is, is going to happen um, is Taylor Serrano. Not at Crow Park. It's going to be in the three arena. Three arena. Um, because I seen Eddie talking to Ariel Helwani and he said for Crow Park, which is under the GAA, which is like... The Gaelic Football. Gaelic yeah. Football Association. Um, they wanted three times more than it cost to rent Wembley out okay, no. which I don't know the exact figures but a lot know, of it's, an, it's a lot of money and I think that that fight's going to land on May the 20th um, obviously the first um, the first fight was you know one of the best mm. fights you'll ever see at Madison Square Garden the um, history makers aren't they yeah and I think mm. you know it, it is it's very frustrating not only for Katie Taylor because that's a box ticked and I don't know whether Katie's got many fights left but I think you know the the fight deserves something like that. Don't get me wrong, the atmosphere is still going to be incredible. And I know it, it, it sort of landed in a busy time for the Gaelic calendar or whatever, but I just think, you know, it would have been a proper momentous occasion. But, you know, Katie Taylor wants big money. Amanda mm. Sano wants big money. And if Eddie's got to pay three times the, the price he pays for Wembley, eventually, you know, the O's run out, you know what yeah. I mean? But, you know, I think if we see that on, I think if we see that on May the 20th, I think, you know, it'll be, a, it'll be a brilliant fight. I know Serrano's actually fighting this weekend. Um, but she's got to come through against Cruz, which, um, you know, I think she will. But, you know, it'll be great to see it. And I honestly think that could be the last time we ever see Katie Taylor. What a career, though, she's had. Oh, I mean, we had Tasha on here talking so so highly about it. Obviously, they fought. Um, Tasha's, I think, is going to fight March 25th at the Echo Arena, um, the MS Bank Arena. But we spoke to Tasha about it. And I know they broke, when they fought in the amateurs, they broke the decibel level record in London or something mm. for like noise. Katie's gone on then to become, you know, multi weight world champion, incredible fighter, come through the fire against Serrano to win. Like, she's just she's an incredible athlete and I just think I think she knows that 
she's at the end. And days are numbered type mm. thing, yeah. And I, I've said this on, on this show. What a way to go out, though, if she does go she out. Beats she beats Serrano, yeah. yeah. And I think it'll be a great fight, but I think she should do it as well. I think she should drop the gloves mm. in Ireland and be like, I've done everything. In my opinion, one of the greatest Irish athletes ever, if not the greatest. Mm. And I just think... I'd rather do that than go and get beat after this fight against someone who shouldn't even be in a ring with her, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And I think she's been so good. She's such a legend that, you know, she, she hopefully she she can go out on on her terms. But um, skipping sports a little bit, I, th- I think we've covered everything in boxing there, but maybe we've missed some stuff, but who knows. But going out with someone who's <laughs> nearly went out on not his own um, terms, <laughs> Al Conor McGregor got bonneted. Bonneted, yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, Jesus, man. <laughs> I, I, was, I thought it was a joke, isn't it, when I watched it? <laughs> the first thing he done was um, get his phone out. Um, there's a couple of theories knocking about it the, online. Oh, that's that... nearly killing me. <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple of theories online that he done it as um, he done it because he's got a lot of negative press about this girl going off the side of his yeah. yacht. I can't. I don't. I don't know. You know, I, it looks the fella is bewildered. He's like, <laughs> can you imagine going out for a drive though, and then the next thing you yeah. see, Conor McGregor's in your back seat, you bonnet at him. But you know, he looked in. Um, he looked in great shape from the pictures he put up of his injuries, um, and then obviously this this sort of momentum is now building um, in and around sort of like the fact that he's going to be on the Ultimate Fighter. He's going to fight Tony Ferguson, who's a, equally as big as a nut job. Or I was listening to Michael Bisping's podcast this week, which is brilliant, about whether he will go and fight Michael Chandler on there. But either way, it looks like he's coming back. Mm. Um, I think a lot of people doubted it. I think I said last week, you know, whether I want to see Conor McGregor back. I think, like, I think everyone does, really. Whether you, whether you love him or you hate him, he's can entertain in any end. Um, I'm a big fan of him, and I love watching his build-up, not just because he's funny, but... Yeah. Um, I think whether... It, He's one of the, he's one of them athletes. Whether you love him or you hate him, he gets bums on seats and he sells tickets. So he's good for the sport, surely. You know. Yeah, I mean, uh, we had a conversation me and Andy once, and he we, when we were talking about the Dana stuff, and he was like, "Well, how can you not well, like what Dana does?" But then like John Jones, and you know, I don't necessarily think Conor McGregor is the nicest fella in the world. No, you know, I wouldn't want to. I, I probably wouldn't want to be locked in a room with him. But like when you when you're looking at it from a sport angle, whether what he does out what he does. Like, I know he's had repercussion for all the stupid stuff he's done, and you know, if he's done this thing on the yacht, he deserves it as well. But in terms of a UFC fighter or an MMA fighter, you can't really look past what he does. You know, he brings he's, he's two eight world champion in cage warriors and then come up to the UFC and did the same. Yeah, and you mm. can, you know, when you see the eyes he brings, despite the fact that he's on a couple of fights scared and getting knocked out by Poirier and breaking his leg. If you put Conor McGregor on Ultimate Fighter, the numbers are going to be mm. ridiculous. The next pay per view that Conor McGregor does beats every pay per view since his last one. Yeah, like you can't deny the star just power, facts, but yeah. he just needs he needs a dance partner now. And I think for me, Michael Chandler, who's been in since he came to the UFC, I think he's had a fight. He's either had a performance bonus or a fight of the night bonus in every single mm. fight. You know, he'll stand there and just swing with McGregor, although he's got a a brilliant wrestling base. But he's not going to use that. He's just going to go at it with McGregor, you know. And I think that's. That's the fight I want to see. Whether it's Tony Ferguson or him, I think I'd love it to see. I'd love it, him and Chandler to do the ultimate fight and then fight. But ultimately, I do want to see McGregor back, and you know, I, I hope it's sooner rather, sooner rather than later. But we had a couple of questions about MMA before we move on. Um, a couple from Merlin who gets involved quite a lot. Um, something that happened here that the UFC have signed a deal with Logan Paul's Prime, Prime yeah. and obviously KSI. Mm. Um, so he just said, what's your thoughts on it? And if you look at it now, Logan's doing business with UFC and Jake Paul signed a contract with PFL. Mm. So the two Logan, the two Paul brothers are now working with the two, maybe, well, it's definitely the leading promotion, PFL, a grown promotion. They're getting their hands on it, aren't they? Mm. You know, one way or another. And I think for all the stick and back and forth the Pauls have had with Dana White, that prime energy drink, the marketing campaign is insane. But for them to now have... A deal that I think it replaces Monster. That's that's next level business. That's like that's I, like I read generational something, business. I read something on Twitter the other day and I was like taken back by it. But have you ever seen a business grow that fast? No, it's incredible. <coughs> not just in in the UK as well. Like mm. the, the, I think Arsenal is it not sponsored Arsenal as well. I don't know, but mm. wherever the wherever the I swear, know, it's, I swear, because obviously KSI is involved and he's an Arsenal fan. I swear. 
they sell at the game. Or I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, like, but I mean, I was in I was in Liverpool Town Centre on Saturday, and we were walking past like a stall. It was a ten of a bottle. Mad, isn't it? And people are and like people are going, ah, it's a ten of a bottle, but people are buying it. Mm-hmm. And then in bulk. Not only has it become this like you know this novelty of like kids wanting it, they now make a moves that is like. That deal, I don't know the specifics of it, but that deal will be incredible. It'll be worth some mm. money. They'll be on the they they be on the canvas of every UFC promotion. So it's going to go from this gimmick online to like the sitting up with the likes of you know Monster mm. and all these energy drinks, and it's happened so quick with two lads off YouTube. It's it, so at some point, you know Logan Paul for me is a bit different to Jake Paul. I've seen him clips him in the WWE, and he looks incredibly talented at it. For me, he's he's just a brilliant businessman. Mm. I know he's on. He's got you know certain things that is not great with like the crypto zoo thing and people saying he scammed them. But to do what they've done with Prime is just it's just incredible. And you can't not respect it. But Merlin goes on to say, and I didn't know this. And if this is true, this puts a big old spanner in not only my works but your works as well. Oh, shit. <laughs> he said, "I know it's next month, but your thoughts on the UFC London being on at American time? Me and Leon will be fighting at five in the morning." Half the crowd's going to be asleep, the other half pulling crazy faces. I've seen the bugs at the O2, they will be. I just think the USC don't give a F about UK fans. What? So I know this does happen a lot, where they'll put it for different territories. So I think when sometimes that the, the UK will have, um, sometimes the UK will have f- like friendly times, but that means that they've got to fight like one in the afternoon in Vegas. But I mean, I've not heard this, but... Merlin, if you can slide into me DMs and let me know where you've seen it or if it's official. I'm not sitting in the old 2 till 5 in the morning. Nah, that's it, everyone, man. <laughs> We're getting down. So me and Jamie See, are going to the camp UFC. Camping back to sleep, we'll be going. We'll be getting the morning train down. I tell you what, if it is, there'll be some shit getting chattered in that <laughs> arena. <laughs> but <laughs> it'd, be like a big, it'd be like one massive kitchen. There'll be so many people if they like, you know, when you... That, you know what? You can do UFC <laughs> as well. <laughs> this could be you. <laughs> <laughs> See the octagon? <laughs> it's you, bro. Next time. Everyone be shadow boxing <laughs> off the, off the dance. Well, like, you know, one fella just in the corner going, I can beat my of me. I do it. No, I can't. Not even that good. No, I can't. Paddy the Baddy's getting it yeah. now. But um, <laughs> if that's true, there's going to be so many fellas who, and, and women get into... London early like me and you were going to do surely, sit down at the booze and they're going I'm not going this so, um, surely it should have been advertised like before people get tickets and that now yeah I mean if it is it's a oh, I'm not happy about that like, I'm not happy at all walking out that arena it's bright and everything is everything oh. is instant hangover we'd have to go from the arena to Houston I'm already it's Mother's Day Sunday so I've already had to I've had to put a written formal request in just to get in. So it's um That's a mad done. That's the first I've heard or seen of it. So I'm yeah. hoping it's actually not true. Yeah, Merlin, slide into me DMs, mate. Give me some give me some um, official announcements there, because that's that's made me really scared to be honest. Um a couple of other sorts of things from the world of MMA. Um Adesanya first Pereira's on again. Mm. Dino done a special announcement, he also announced Gilbert Dorino Burns against Street Jesus himself, Master Vidal. Um that in itself is a good fight. Everyone likes to see so to Masvidal whenever he fights. I'm a big fan of Burns. I think he'll beat Masvidal, but I would have liked to see it in London, actually. But yeah, I think that's a good fight. But Adesanya Pereira, it's just the the, the fight that won't go away. You know? I mean, they fight twice in kickboxing. Animals, don't they? Yeah, oh, I mean, that Pereira's one scary to be mm. But they, they fight twice in kickboxing. Point victory for Pereira. Knocks out Adesanya. Fight in the UFC. Adesanya is cruising. Nearly stops him. Get stopped in the last round by you a gas hell. house or well, I think if there was ten seconds left in the round where he hit Pereira, he wins by knockout, mm. and this is done. But I mean, that left hook or what Pereira throws it's just money, it, yeah. mad. Like when he hits people with it, they just don't recover. Mm. And you know, I'm I'm a big, I'm a massive Adesanya fan. Actually, I think he can take a dig as well, obviously, yeah. can he? Yeah, but yeah, but he was rocked by Adesanya, mm. but and he's been rocked in the past by Adesanya in kickboxing, but somehow. With this just crazy tribal nature, yeah, just he just recovers and then just marches you down, knocks you out. And I think surprisingly, Adesanya starting as the favourite um, to recapture his belt. And I'd love to see him win it back. But at what point does Adesanya look across that? What more? Off to go. Like, yeah. I just can't beat this mm. fella. 
Like there's a thing where um, there's a there's a cool thing, and I don't know if it's genuine or not, but there's a very famous clip of Adesanya, and he does this thing, um, it's okay, I'm prepared to die, where he goes mm. into the fifth round against Calvin Gaston, and then there's one of Pereira saying, it's okay, I'm prepared to kill. Yeah. And you think, at what point do you look at someone <coughs> and just go, you are my kryptonite, mate, yeah. like just leave Fuck me alone. That, yeah. But I mean that that happens on April eighth. I hope it's in um, I hope it's in Madison Square Garden. Um, I just think it's an incredible fight. It's one that. I really hope Adesanya can come through and put put a nail in that story once and for all. But, you know, I just think sometimes people have just got your number, haven't they? Yeah. And, and what can you do about it? It's, it's, it's one of them. But um, the only other little bit of um, sort of news, it's not news, but something I've seen this week, Paddy, done a, Paddy the Baddy done a um, podcast with George St. Pierre, which is a good listen if anyone wants to go. And it's his first thing since the Jared Gordon fight. And he actually asked George St. Pierre about... He said, I thought I won the fight, I've watched it back, I don't know if I did, I'm getting unrivaled stick that I've never had before, I don't know how to deal with it, have you got any advice for me? Mm. It was really good and it was good to see Paddy open up like that, I know he's got um, he's got himself a uh, surgery coming up in early March yeah. for him to, you know, hopefully get back for the back end of summer, but yeah, I think it was good to see, it was kind of good to see that human side of Paddy where, because I was quite disappointed with his reaction after Vegas in terms of, you know, I thought of one, I thought mm. I smashed them, I did this, who's the boy and all that. It's it's one of them we spoke about um we spoke about it regarding um leading up to the yard fight about being in the camp and um needing a team around you to say like you're getting beat or whatever. Mm. And it, and we said about oh, because you as a fighter, you know, we don't know because we're not in there, but I'm sure you can't imagine whether you know if you're winning or yeah. or how the fight's fan or so I think the immediate reaction from Paddy He's won, I'm sure he's just kind of, he is a showman, so I'm sure he was just kind of show it, be confident and be his persona, which I can completely understand. And, you know, to go back and watch it and say, I met, oh, look, because there's no doubt about it, there was an argument whether, you know, if, if Jared Gordon did win, um, that people would say, oh, he deserves it. Look, I was there, mm. and um, in an unbiased, obviously, I was there for Paddy and wanted Paddy to win, but I had Paddy winning on the night anyway, you know what I mean? I, did, I knew I said it was close but I had him winning and um so I weren't too surprised by it as well. But obviously I seen the the backlash of it and people were surprised and I can understand though. Um I haven't seen nothing that you were on about but if he has someone said that then, then fair play, you know what I mean? Yeah. I I said that I was I you know, you get adrenaline that I just wanted Paddy because 'cause I'm a fan of Paddy and I want him to go far but I'm I'm a bit uncomfortable with this whole new McGregor thing. I think Paddy's being streamlined into a fast track that I don't necessarily think he's ready for. So mm. I I said on the show actually I don't I think a defeat for Paddy would have been the best thing to happen to him because it would have stripped back Paddy's star power is going nowhere because mm. he's 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 a character and he's doing a, a lot of great stuff outside of the octagon in terms of his podcast and his drink with applied nutrition all this stuff. He's a clever kid, but I want to see him do his career at his pace. Yeah. Don't rush him into being McGregor and end up getting knocked out. Don't have to. Just just progress at your pace. And and I just thought it was great to see Paddy with a bit of humility and saying, you know, look, yeah, I don't know. And asking someone like George St. Pierre, who, you know, one of the greatest of all time, for some for some advice is, is mm. not bad at all. I think it's... The, people are easy to jump on him and say, you know, he's not quite what we think he is. But, look, he might have had an off night, but... He, Bottom line, he still got the win, and you know if he did, you know KO Jared Gordon or whatever, then it'd be everyone would be even believing hype train even more. And yeah. I mean, so it, it's kind of it's it's such a thin line of things. But um, I right, look, we we all hope that he goes all the way, don't we? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I just want him to see him maximize his career because I think he can be a, a brilliant part of of the UFC. But um, we'll end on horse racing this week. We've got a few things to talk about there. Um, none more so than Josh the Boss. Which is yeah. a nice little win. But I think a couple of things that are popping up that me and you both enjoy. Rugby League's back in March, um, so I can't wait to get stuck into that. But something that me and you bond over quite a lot, Formula One, mm. is back on the 3rd of March. All the new cars are starting to be... Um, Team Red Bull. Yeah, you and your little... I think Red Bull... Um, I think Red Bull said they were announcing tomorrow, but they've called it a season launch rather than a new car launch. Mm. So I'm thinking they're keeping their little cheating car away for a while. Go on, go on and cheat again but um, I think you know I, I'm absolutely buzzing for this I know 13th of November Drives to Survive comes out which I'm you know buzzing for um, and I just think I think this year could be incredible because Lewis has got to react Max mm. has got to go and you know solidify himself it's just 
it's one of them where you know it's interesting co- to see well Ferrari come back like you know yeah. I know they started off so quick last year and then some catastrophic team decisions which just <laughs> oh, absolutely <laughs> killed them and I think um, there needs to be a serious revamp in their yeah. team and, and get it sorted so um, and I think McLaren finished fairly strong didn't he and that's your yeah. team so I think you know um, McLaren could be up there again obviously got good drivers so um, it'd be interesting but I can only see another result and that's be, Red Bull yeah I think it'd be a weird one because obviously we won't have no Daniel Ricciardo this year um, mm. which would be but McLaren have replaced him with Oscar Piastri who looks an absolute beast in, in like the smaller codes but obviously you've got like George Russell who was you know going toe for toe with Lewis they're definitely going to have an internal battle this year mm. about who's the number one driver because guarantee you know George Russell is thinking Lewis is coming to the end here mm. I want to be the number one driver at Mercedes obviously Mick Schumacher's fell out he's now the reserve driver over at, at McLaren but then you've got an internal battle also at Ferrari where it's like you know Charles Leclerc was good last year Sainz wasn't great but that'll be the same thing Sainz is like I'm not going to be accepting a number two driver no. do you? not like Charles won the, the world championship although you know he, he was going he was driving well but th- there'll be an internal battle there obviously Perez and Verstappen fell out towards the back end of last year so is he going to be as good as, of a teammate this mm-hmm. year or not I think there's just so much narrative around Formula 1 next season I just think I just can't wait mate I yeah can't wait. it is it is one of the best sports and I'm obviously a, a new fan of it the past year, uh, two years um, but yeah I love it and it's that's what my Sundays are all about when I oh. put it on it's because it's in the summer as well mm. the amount of times last year where it'd be on a friendly I even liked I think um, this year the day of the Grand National, it was the Australian. Mm. So, because I, I can't sleep in the Grand National yeah, anyway, yeah. I'm up, I'm like six o'clock, I was like, right, I'll watch this, start yeah, getting fun. ready. And I just loved it. But um, we'll speak loads more about this this year. Hopefully you're going to be sticking around with the podcast. Um, then, obviously, a little bit of news, which Andy would have been buzzing about. Djokovic won the Australian Open mm. um, to equal Rafa Nadal's record of 22 Grand Slams. Called it the biggest victory of his life because of you know COVID everything that's gone on with that, the, yeah. you know people, and I just think you know it was a bit of justice for him because he's been through a lot. He's been his name's been dragged through the mud, and I mean you run out of superlatives to talk about them three, but what they've done, mate. Elite, aren't they? Mm. <laughs> and I think Murray gets a lot of in tennis gets a lot of shit done, but like mm. I think you know he's in an era where the three of the best tennis players will. Can probably ever see, and uh, and you know, there's not not just on one occasion he's mixed it with them all. I mean, and mm. um, you know, even what he did in the in the open the other week, you know, then I think he set the record to the longest games or whatever twice or whatever. So, yeah. um, I always think he deserves a bit of credit for mixing with them because the three of them are just yeah ridiculously talented and the freaks, um, mate, absolute freaks. Maybe I think. it's a sad day when I think Roger and. Nadal are at the end now, aren't they? I think Djokovic yeah. still got a few more years. Well, um, I think Murray's at the end as well. So it's a generation of unbelievable sportsmen. No, yeah. Good luck following. I haven't mm. watched that um, Breakpoint yet on Netflix. No, it's I don't meant think to be I really know. good, but um, you know, it's it's going to be very difficult for that next sort of generation to live up to them, and it's quite unfair, really. But we'll finish on horse racing because our friend TSB has got a good question, which I'll round the show off with, but. You know, it's always good to get your your input on on horse racing. I mean, there's been a couple of things. You know, trainers banned this Ronald yeah. McNally, is it? Mm. You know, Willie Willie Mullins, it's four thousand career wins. The kid who me and you were talking about, Billy Lochnane, is it? Just Billy. going through cards. <laughs> Billy's gone through cards, and I think um, I think Billy has gone out to America now. Is he? Um, to save his claim. Save his claim means so to ride out your claim thing on the flat, you have to have ninety winners. Um, and Billy has basically only started in this new year and I think he's on about 20 odd already he had 20 winners since the start of January yeah so he needs to be careful because you know there's no point using your claim up in the winter because it's average racing on the flat and mm. um, he'll get a lot of use of it in the summer in the big races Royal Ascot, Glorious Good with all them so I think he's gone out to America because if you ride winners in America it doesn't affect your claim in England so um. I think he's gone. He's going there for a few weeks and just take it easy to someone. And I think Billy Lochnane's a, a name you're looking at. That'll be in all the headlines come the summer. Yeah, I think he, he earned more than hundred grand in prize money since the start of since the start mm. of January. He was re- he was winning one in four races he did in, he mm. did in 
And he's, he's 16 years of age. He's 16, he can't even drive a car. Mm. But he's just steering absolute thoroughbreds through the field. <laughs> Genius. But I'm, I'm a big um, National Hunt fan, but it's, it's let me down this season. I haven't enjoyed it at all. And I think the flat in the summer is something I'm looking forward to. Not only because, you know, your mate O'Sheen's coming back, but I just I think, think... two weeks... I think... I think... Two weeks today, I think it might be, actually. I think 16th. I think... Um, I think he'd be champion jockey again. Yeah. Mm. But you got, I mean, I hope he is, but you got O'Sheen and then, you know, not that I overly agree with it, but you got like Frank of the Tories victory lap. Then you've got kids like this who are going to be mm. riding at all the big shot. And like, you want to, you'll, you know, I'll go to certain flat meetings this summer and I want to see this kid, Billy yeah, Lockman, and see how he gets on. I think it's an exciting time, but, you know, the sport does somehow find itself to, um, you know, mess up. I know we've got this big thing about something I don't really understand. Really, the 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 whip rules and the mm. fact that people are getting banned but not banned, or saying if you would have done that, you get. So banned. they implemented these new rules where so they come in saying that we couldn't use um, the whip in our backhand, which is or our forehand. Or so a backhand, you hold the whip so the whip is down, and you hit the horse like that. And then you flip it over so the w- the stick is up like that, and then you hit them like that. So you can get more force doing it that way, basically. Mm. So they f- initially banned it from using like that. So we had to just keep it down and hit them like that. And then they've realised it's, it's impossible because, you know, jockeys is, are all different shapes and sizes and so are horses. So if you've got, like, the likes of Sean Bowen, who's small, he's having to overextend to make sure he's hitting the horse in the, in, the correct, in the correct place, you know what I mean? Whereas if you can hit it in the forehand, you can reach it on its flank where it's meant to be hitting. Because if you leave it short, you're effectively hitting the horse in the rib cage, which is not nice for the horse, not nice for us. We don't want to be doing that. Um, so then they've come in and implemented these new rules that you can't. You can now use it in the forearm, but you can't lift it above your head, which is just it's just ridiculous. Because again, jockeys have different styles and heights and sizes, and horses different sizes. Yeah. So now when you come in after a ride, they say, "Oh." In the new rules, you would have got 28 days ban there. And you're just like, it's just ridiculous. What so, like, jockeys at the, t- at the elite level, like, I think Harry, the festival, Harry, Harry Cobden rode a double at Cheltenham last weekend. Sean Bowen won the cross country race, I think. Um, both of them come in and got told they would have had 25 days each. So, that, so that, that ban will kick in in two weeks' time. So they 25 days, they missed the Mr. First, uh, and the Grand Festival. National, they? Oh, no, they oh, no, just, just yeah. back for the Grand National. But, I mean, yeah, it's ridiculous. What I don't get is, from my very limited knowledge of the intricacies of it, the whip is designed fundamentally to be a correction tool for the horse and it yeah. to run the right. It doesn't... To it's basically not, persuade it, yeah. It's not designed not to hurt them in any no. point. So as long as your technique is safe and you're not mm. hitting it across the head... Mm. Why are they trying to mess around with people's technique? Uh, that's the thing they've, I've said it before. The BHA, uh, I'd say majority of them have never sat on a horse. Yeah. Never been in stables with a horse, never looked after a horse, never done what we do with the horses, you know what I mean? There's not one jockey out there that wants to hurt any horse. Yeah. You know what I mean? And if they are, they're not welcome in, in the sport. Um, the, these whips, I should, I should bring one in really to show everyone, but... Uh, they call the pro cush the, the the cushion like if I hit you it wouldn't hit you you know what I mean so mm. it's not going to hurt half it's an animal you know what I mean yeah and if effectively if an horse doesn't want to do something I promise you now will not do it I won't move yeah you seen just, that yeah it just say like, nah spew you lad <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't even try honestly because we have some horses that fall out of love with the game don't want to race anymore they won't race yeah and then they'll be retired like it's just yeah. horse they, they, they're own they're not robots they're their own minds they do yeah what they want to do you know what I mean. We had um, an announcement this week that formal dress codes are being dropped at Jockey Club courses, including AT and Cheltenham. Not at Royal Ascot, because mm. that's not under the Jockey Club. But spectators will be encouraged to dress as they feel most comfortable and confident. Replica sports shirts and offensive clothing will not be allowed. It, changes will apply to 342 fl- fixtures, including the Grand National. Now, I like it, because I understand people who go to the racing may not be able to afford a three-piece suit and might feel a bit... Mm. But for the life of me, why are you trying to fix a dress code when to get in the course it's seventy quid? That's I think that's the, big, the, one ticket price the biggest down. the biggest deflection is that exactly. Like, the, let people get everyone, in first. Everyone's giving them grief over ticket prices and um, look, we're not effective, thankfully, because we you know riding and things. We we I can't remember last time we paid to go on a mm. race course, but 
you see it, you know what I mean? And like you're there, people's troubles and you know, to pay ridiculous amounts to get in there and then have to pay. I think Cheltenham the other week other day was ten, twelve pounds for a, a pint or whatever. Yeah, it was, or a, a gin and tonic. A pint, gin and, tonic like and it's just pounds. like think before you're asked about what people are wearing bring it down and get people through the door and i mean it's just like um i seen a thing the other day we're not attracting crowds and it was actually racing blogger who, who like doesn't mm. have an opinion and i've laughed at him a few times but he was like how are you gonna attract the crowd like i think it was like a wednesday like mm. red car and they're like trying mm. to charge people mad money to, like true honestly and like you know what some of the smallest actually wouldn't earn half as much not even a, a tenth as much as Cheltenham and entry and stuff um in the summer racing, you go to the summer racing and it'd be a five or entry or something or ten or entry. It's packed and it's yeah. a boss atmosphere. And like summer racing, it, it's not great quality for us, like riding over jumps, but it's a boss atmosphere and there's families there and like you really enjoy going. I mean, mm. it's usually in the evening, it's nice weather and things. But you'd, you'd have Ainchy packed out. I know it is on the, um, at the Ainchy Festival and that, but like the summer meetings and that are not as, yeah. as, not as big. Same with Newbury, massive course, amazing track, but barely has any any crowds there. And yeah. I mean, it's a shame, but it's what the BHA are like. I think and, it was actually Newbury where the, that racing blogger was yeah. walking around and he was like, there's no one here. Honestly, it's, it's one of the, probably my favourite track in the whole country. And it, I can't remember the last time mm. it, was, it was Chocker. Do you know what? Um, we'll finish on. Josh the boss who you rode on sat oh you rode on Saturday our newest little recruit yeah. from fourth so that's an exciting thing for us to get involved with definitely this year. Yeah. he's um Josh the boss yeah he ran in a, a bumper which is a national and flat race um he's only four um but you know so if people don't know uh, race horses as a birthday is uh, all put down as the first of January just to kind of keep it the, like four year old five year olds three year olds blah 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 but like most of them are fold around March and April and time and I think Josh the Boss was actually born in May so effectively he's actually only three you know mm. so he's a three year old and he was running against kind of four or five or six year olds and he mixed it with the best I think he finished um, he finished fourth not being very far and um, you know for a big baby and his second time ever at, at school effectively um, it's one hell of a run and um, you know he's not bred to kind of win these races so for him to be bang there and mix is mm. exciting for us and um you know albeit i think he's gonna run in kempton in a four-year-old race at the at the beginning of march and then you know hopefully he runs well and then you know quite possibly we could all see him at uh ain't you in april be great that if we can mm. get him to the to the national meet with more on that as the weeks go by but TSB, you get involved all the time on Patreon. You know, I remember that. I remember that we all appreciate. He actually was talking about racing affordability, and that's where the point come from. He's a massive horse racing fan. You'll hear it from what he says here. It gives us great detail, but he basically is basically saying that it is no longer placed mm. being able to go. So TSB says, has horse racing become a victim of its own success with a much criticised proposed that Cheltenham Festival be in five days, pint of lager now seven pound, and a regular tax ticket between fifty and eighty, which I think is deliberately trying to price out working class people. As someone with Asperger's and ADHD, I loved horse racing and used to read time form religiously and Mark Howard's ahead on the flat and one jump ahead yearly. And I went racing everywhere from Kempton on the midweek, even in floodlit all weather, to Down Royal in the Soham West Island when the listener slash Andrew McNamara won the J Wine Chase Chase to Weatherby to see Deep Purple a guy. win the Charlie Hall, and also he won when I went to Huntingdon for the Peterborough Chase. Also seen Twist Magic win his second single creek at Sandown, and Camelot win in the Epsom Derby and Oaks in 2012, and several Royal Ascots and Cheltenhams and Aintees, and even went to random visits to Wolverhampton, which has got a holiday in, in the parade <laughs> ring. <laughs> I also, actually has. <laughs> yeah. anyway, also went to the Dante meeting at York and won it um, and won it with Bonfire, accidentally walked into the yeah. VIP area, B area Enjoy two mojitos or an hors d'oeuvres <laughs> or whatever they're called, and snarled and snarled Andrew Lloyd Webber because in that week in the Telegraph he said the rich pay me too much tax. <laughs> but for obviously, you know, TSB's given us his incredible interest in no, horse racing. Yeah, that, that brought a smile to my face. That and because that is what he's written there is what horse racing's all about. And I mean, mm. seeing them like elite level horses and like. McNamara, you know, sadly he's passed away now, but like one of the best jockeys around, and and that is what you want people because we experience that 
but like we want everyone to experience how good the sport actually is. And I mean, but mm. unfortunately, it's, it's run by complete idiots. And until we kind of get them out and you know get ex professional jockeys in the board and like try and get it back to what it can be like, unfortunately, like it's there's going to be a lot of TSBs out there who you know don't love the sport. Love the sport. He's seen some amazing horses there. There's reeled off for anyone who doesn't know who they are, like the top level horses and um you know amazing size now and like Cam- camelot and things and that's what we want to see like we have an horse constitutional now who you know i'd want everyone to see live like he probably will be at ain't he because this horse is a freak of nature and like how fast he can run is just like it'll blow your mind away for the national on horse and people need to see that but i can completely understand like why you wouldn't why you wouldn't yeah why would you? I think when I look at horse racing, and we have conversations all the time about them, you know, not not including people. Look at the fan that they've essentially lost in. Mm, I know, exactly. <laughs> and, like, he's so enthusiastic about it and what we want. And it's not just, like, the prize money is going down as well for, for us lads, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, like, effectively, lads are going elsewhere to, to ride horses, whether it be America or whatever. And, and we're the same. You know, the standards of the races, like, are food-wise in the canteen, you know, it's bang average and stuff you probably wouldn't even eat yourself at home and i mean and we're meant to be professional athletes and at the elite level of the sport but you know it's not just ticket pricing where the sport's gone bad like it's it's honestly right through yeah, it needs a, it needs a huge revolution and i think people will be listening to this i think honestly listening to this chat we've had for the last 10 or whatever minutes and tsbs and, there'll be people listening to this going i don't really like horse racing but i might give it a go mm. and that's what if we i know we've been a bit negative about it but we're only being honest but to watch it and be at the races is one of the best things oh, you can do. Mate, honestly. And it's brilliant, but like I honestly think people now look at it. So on a Saturday afternoon, for example, if you've got a free weekend and you go, I'll go and do something, and then you go, I might go down to Aintree, let me look at the ticket. Fucking hell, 75 yeah, quid. no chance. Like, mm. you, like, it's stupid because it's backwards as well from a business perspective because if you get people in the door, they will spend money. Mm. To stop like 100%, yeah. trying to be this like class classy oh and I think TSB nits the nail net. I think they want a certain level of people not to go, but mm. what they what they fail to like see is that all the people that you're trying to attract, like the Instagram people, they're not gonna be at your racing on a Wednesday. No, no, chance, yeah. <laughs> they'll be there at Royal Ascot when there's a camera and mm. that's about it. And if you if you base it around that the sport will fail. Well I know the is lads in there, T S B like you wonder that are fighting for people like this, you know what I mean? Like, mm. whether it's jockeys, ex jockeys, trainers, whatever there is, good people in there who are, who are fighting to get it back to what it was. And um, look, we got some incredible horses that are going to run a ring on our doorstep that, you know, I want as many people to get down there as possible, you know what I mean? But I can mm. completely understand why you wouldn't, because if I went riding there, I probably wouldn't go myself, you know? No. So. Well, to be honest, like, as a parent, you know, I probably would have to. You know, it's just my own situation. But if I wanted to go to the Grand National and I was paying for where I wanted to sit or be, I wouldn't be able to just rock up and buy it. I'd no have to be thinking yeah. now. Yeah, like, 100%. Or me and me and yeah. missus want to go, probably going to cost us best part of 175 quid before we bought it to mm. drink. I have to put money away or something like 100%. that. And it's, it's, it's like one of the biggest sporting events on your doorstep. But there'd be lads in there, like, that, you know, let, let's say uh, let's say Liverpool lad, for instance, has got a ride at Angie, wants all his family there. He gets given two tickets. Yeah. You know what I mean, and like the like rest of his family probably not gonna be able to go and watch him do that because uh, not just a Liverpool lad, any lad riding ain't it's such a big festival, like um and same with Cheltenham, like and to not have your family there when you do on the top level of the game, like it's sad, isn't it? Mm. But it's just reality and but as I say, there is lads working to try and fix it and help it, you know, so fingers crossed yeah. it, it we do see change. No, definitely brought up some really important points there. And again, thanks for everyone who got involved on Patreon. That's a massive part of the show. Um, I think we've done good time there. I think we've had a chat mm. about so many things. If you are, if you obviously enjoyed the podcast, come and get involved on Patreon. It's a pound a week. It's a great, it's a great laugh on there. And also, we've got a bonus episode with Jazza Dickens coming out on Saturday, where me and him had a chat about life boxing upcoming fights. You know his position. It, it was a great chat. So look out for that. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks, Jay. Nice on. And um, yeah, we'll see you again next week. See you soon.